I believe God is, He's been shifting things in the atmosphere so that you can receive this Word. Wherever you are, just, just let your heart be ready to receive this. But, you know, it was obviously Father's Day on Sunday. Do we have any fathers here in the room with us tonight? Wow, come on, can we take a moment and honour the dads in the room? I want to say we could do a little better for the dads here in the room tonight. It's so good. If you're a dad here in the room, we honour you. If you're a dad watching online, we want to take a moment and honour you tonight. I'm trying to not look at you, Bernie, because if I look at you, you're going to think that that's acceptable for you to leave, but I don't want you to leave. But if you need to leave, you can leave. But I was getting ready to bring this message in. I was just reminded of the very start of mankind's existence here on the earth, back in the garden, where we got to experience, Adam and Eve got to experience close proximity with the Father, the perfect Father, God their Father. In fact, as I was reading this, I, I, I want to take a moment, I'm going to... I'm, I'm not going to preach this message to men tonight, but if you're a man in the room, I want you to just pay extra special attention because I believe God wants to do some things in your life tonight. And in fact, as I was reading through this, thinking about what happened in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, we read this particular verse, and this is just a complete side note to where I'm going to go with my message tonight, but it says in Genesis chapter 2 that God created man to work and to take care of to work and to take care of. You realise that mankind, but especially man, because this was the context of this, this is before Eve was there, there was a, a mandate to work and to take care of. That's what the Scripture says, to work and to nurture. I was, I was taking my daughter's little mini, my daughter Holly has a, this mini Cooper and it's this cool little car and the sunroof broke on it the other day. And so I called up, in fact, I was trying to get online to book an appointment for, to, to get this thing looked at. And as I was getting online, I, I went through the whole week and couldn't find one single appointment for this car to get looked at in the whole week. And I went to the next week and there was not one single appointment. And I went to the next week and the next week. I, you know, I got six weeks in and I couldn't get, I, I couldn't find an appointment online to book in this car to get serviced. And so I, I have the number for our service manager at the, the dealership. So I called them and said, hey, I, I think there's a problem with, um, you know, with your system. Because I, I, I scrolled through six weeks and I couldn't find an open spot for me to bring in this car to get looked at. And my service provider, Debbie, she's an amazing woman. She said, you know what, just, just bring the car down and we'll, we'll get it fixed up for you. And so I took the car down there and, and I said, hey, you know, was, it, was there a problem with the system? She said, no, there's no problem with the system. She said, you know what the problem is? We can't get people to work. I said, what do you mean you can't get people to work? She said, you know, ever since we had to shut down for COVID, we can't get people to come back to work. Now, it's not like this dealership pays their people badly. It's just that people have lost the drive to work. Now, you may have lost a job during COVID and we'll be praying for you that God has something better for you. But can I, can I tell you this, especially men here in this room, men watching online, you were created to work. You were designed to work. If you lost your job and you're getting unemployment benefits, there's nothing wrong with that. But can I tell you this? You weren't designed and created to live your life constantly, continually receiving benefit. You were actually designed to work. Don't get in the habit of not working because part of your fulfilment of who God created you to be all the way back in the garden is to work. But not only were you meant to work, and this is, you know, I, I am guilty of this. And about 10 years into our marriage, I almost had to learn the hard way that there's more to life and marriage than just work. Yeah. You got a little quiet in the room here. Because it's not just about working. God didn't just create you to work. He created you to work and to take care of. Yeah. To work and to nurture. This is a word to some husbands here in the room tonight. Maybe some husbands watching online. You're not just designed to work to take care of your family. You've got to work and then nurture your family as well. It's part of the mandate that God has given you as a man. To work and to nurture. Yeah. But that's a side note. 
I was thinking about back in the garden, this close proximity, but here's what happens, friends. Because of sin, all of a sudden there's a disconnect from what was a perfect scenario, a perfect environment, a perfect relationship between the Father and His children. But because of sin, there was now a separation. And I love this, you know, Pastor Paul was talking about this a few weeks ago at church. How the whole way through Scripture, all the way from that moment of disconnect, we find God who was once close and then for a moment seemed to be far away because of sin. All of a sudden we begin to see all the way through the context of the Word of God. This God who was once far away coming closer and closer and closer. We read of a handful of individuals in the Old Testament who experienced God, not just at a corporate level, but experienced God in a close proximity via His Holy Spirit. They got to experience maybe an encounter that was a close contact with God the Father, but it was saved, it was reserved for the few. Most were kept at a distance, had to be outside the veil, outside the courts. But as we fast forward through to the New Testament, the God who was once far away wanted to be close to Him his children, so He sends His Son, His own flesh, to come and be around us so that we, as a humanity, could touch Him. We could experience Him. We could sense Him close. But then in the moment that seems like God is once again going far away when Jesus dies and leaves this, He resurrects and then He leaves this earth. And it seems in a moment that God has once again left mankind, except that when Jesus left, He didn't leave us with nothing. He left us with the Holy Spirit. So now not only this God who we once sensed far away, we could touch with our hands now, he takes it one step further. Not only can we touch Him, but we can feel Him because He is now present on the inside of us via His Holy Spirit. It's not limited to just a handful of people. It's not just limited to one location. Every single person has access to this God who seemed once far away. This is the Father who is coming close. And as we celebrated Father's Day over the weekend, I couldn't help but think of those that maybe feel especially at a time like this, disconnected from their earthly father, a moment of pain as they realize that maybe their father, maybe your father tonight was not a great example of a heavenly father. Maybe you had a tumultuous childhood. Maybe there was pain in your household. Maybe your parents divorced. Maybe your dad abandoned you and you never have seen him again or had little contact. Maybe you're a dad here in the room and right now you feel the pain of divorce, the pain of separation. Can I tell you this tonight, friends? There is a God who despite our pain wants to come close. He wants to come close. He wants to come close to you tonight. On Friday, I was driving around with my kids. Alex was out at a meeting and I was driving the kids to drop them off somewhere. And our kids, Holly and Taylor. Holly's just turned 18 and Taylor, he's 13 and he thinks that he's taller than me. He's still a couple inches off, but man, he's taking it by faith. <laughs> Literally every day, he just walks up and kind of looks down his nose at me and I'm like, hey, just settle down. But also I'm super proud of that. Every Sunday morning, he texts me, hey dad, can I wear your shoes? Can I wear your sneakers? Every week, I love it. But we were driving around on Friday and somehow we were talking about you know, 80s TV shows and stuff. And, and, uh, and they were telling me about a show. And, and as we were talking about it, it just kind of took me to this moment, this spirit-led moment of having to find the Toto playlist on Spotify, right? Some of you are like, Who, who's that? And, and I hear, hit play on the playlist and the first song is Africa. And we're just sitting in the car jamming away and I'm kind of like, I'm a little impressed that my 18 year old even knows what this song is. Anyone old enough to remember Toto when they first, you know, were kind of around? Anyone young enough to think that Africa was actually just a song that came out with Stranger Things? Okay, some of you in the room. And it gets to the end of Africa and then the next song comes on and, and, and it, it kind of, it, it goes like this. And 
and, and Anyone know Hold The Line? I mean, this song came out in 1978 and I was getting ready to press skip and Holly was like, oh man, I love this song. <laughs> Hold The Line. Love isn't always on time. Love isn't always, love isn't always on time. Bobby Kimball, man. <laughs> Holly knew every lick to this and I was like, I kind of had this proud moment of like, I win. I win as a dad. My 18 year old is like, just fully invested in this. Anyhow, it took me back to this, this moment. And this is what's so crazy because she just turned 18. But honestly, it, it feels like it was a moment ago. They were at the hospital ready to bring her home. And I'll never forget that moment because like many dads, I had other dads before me say to me, Son, there's just one thing that you need to do before you leave for the hospital. Make sure you put the car seat in the car before you leave. Don't wait till the day. Don't, don't wait till your wife's having contractions. Don't, you know, some of you fathers in the room just got a little quiet because you're like, yeah, yeah, I was one of those guys. There's no shame here tonight. But I was one of those dads that was, or dad-to-be that was like, you know what, I got this. We're all gonna be fine. Everything's gonna be right. Except that in the moment it wasn't as I'm trying desperately to get this car seat in and I'm reading the instructions, having an absolute man-male moment going, these instructions are wrong! <laughs> Again. <laughs> and it made me think, honestly, that no matter how prepared you think you are as a dad, you're never really prepared to be a dad. And in fact, no matter how much you think you're prepared to be a man, you might be a young man here in the room watching online, no matter how much you feel prepared or unprepared, nothing will ever fully prepare you to be a man. And I stand here tonight as a father and a husband and as a, a, a dad who's done many good things along the way and had some pretty monumental failures as well. I wanna tell you this tonight, there's no perfect dad here in this room. There's no perfect dad watching online, but there is a perfect father that you can bring your pain to, that you can bring your hurt, that you can bring your failures to. And I thank God that in my mess ups along the way, that I haven't been showing my kids just how to be like me. I've been showing them how to be like the father who's perfect, who's never gonna let them down. Even if their dad has some failures along their way, the heavenly father's never gonna let them down. If you're a dad here in the room, or maybe you're not even a dad, but you're a man and you feel like, man, I've just messed up so bad. Can I, can I just say tonight, there's grace, but don't run from God, run to God. Because tonight I believe He wants to restore what the enemy's trying to, be, trying to steal from you. As I share this message over just the, the next few minutes that we have tonight, that I wanna say this, I, I am gonna preach this especially to men, especially to dads. But if you're, if you're a lady here in the house tonight, if you're a single lady, don't switch off and think, you know what, this is my time to leave. No, don't, don't switch off. Take this as a framework for the godly man. Maybe you're single, but you're believing God for a husband. Take this as some framework. Take it as a reference point. Because you know what? Society's given you a pretty messed up reference point right now. Society's given you a pretty messed up framework. But I want to let you in on something tonight. I want to let you in on what a man of God should really look like. And if you're a wife here in this room, or if you're a wife who's watching online, and you might hear some of this and you might think, man, Oh man, that is not my man. Please don't weaponize this message against your husband. In fact, would you weaponize this against the enemy and his plans for your husband because your marriage is not over? It may not be that great right now, but don't use this against him. Use it against the enemy and stand up and say, you know what? My husband may not quite be there right now, but I'm gonna take this in faith and I'm gonna go into the prayer closet and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna nag him to get there. I'm gonna pray him to his breakthrough. I'm not gonna nag him to his, I'm gonna pray him to his breakthrough in Jesus' name. God can do it. God can do it. God can do it. I want to read from Matthew chapter 6, a, a passage that I'm sure that most of us are well familiar with. But tonight, I, I'm going to take it as a bit of a side context. But in Matthew chapter 6, 
verse 9, this is Jesus talking to his disciples and he's teaching them how to pray. And he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's, it's a passage that I'm sure if you've been in church for a, a, a short time even that you've heard before. But it's interesting when we read this and as I was studying for this message, I had this kind of epiphany moment where I realised that, you know, a lot of the times when Jesus is talking about the Father, He refers to Him as my Father. Many times throughout the New Testament as Jesus is talking, He most often, rather than referring to the Father, He'll say, my Father. But it hit me as I was reading this because if you would think that that's the way Jesus would refer to His Father, that when He's teaching His disciples, He would teach His disciples to do the same thing. And as I was reading it, it seemed a little odd to me that if Jesus referred to Him as my Father, why would He teach His disciples to pray not my Father, but our Father? And I began to realise that oftentimes we default to thinking that it's all about us. I don't know if there's any, any people in the room that are an only child. You know, there's people that grew up with both mom and dad just kind of waiting on them like, yes, your Royal Highness. You had no, you know, no sibling rivalry. Man, you just lived in this utopia. Now I know that's not totally true for everyone, but I, I don't want to speak about, you know, only children in the natural. I just, I want to take a moment and just give you this little context tonight, because I think for some of us, we view ourselves like, in the spiritual sense, an only child. When we pray, what do, God, I'm going to need you to do this for me right now. Hey God, I, you know, I need that breakthrough. I need that financial breakthrough. God, I need that breakthrough in my health. God, I need that breakthrough in my job. God, I'm going to need that breakthrough in my marriage. I'm going to need that breakthrough in my children's life. God, I'm going to need this. 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 And Jesus knew that our default is to always be thinking about ourselves. But here's the thing. You can't pray, you can't pray our Father unless you first understand it as my Father. But you also can't pray my Father unless you realize the context in which Jesus is teaching His children. Because He's not saying, hey, this is about you on your own. He's putting you in the context that this is not about your will, but about His will. See, when we pray, my Father, we're thinking, my will. But when we pray, our Father, we're no longer thinking, my will, we're thinking, your will, because, let, let me put it like this. My kids, they could both individually refer to me and say, you know what, that's my dad. That would be true. They could also refer to me and say, that's our dad, because that would also be true. See, they understand that as their dad, I'm not only taking care of their personal interests, but I'm also taking care of the family's interests. And even though their concern is important, so is the family's concern. See, if we only view God through the sense of my Father, then we miss the context of the fact that God has placed us in the family of God. See, it's our Father. See, your Christianity, your Christian walk is not just a personal experience. It's very much personal, but it's also a communal experience. And that's the part that often is frustrating for us. Because we're like, uh, I'm going to need it to be my father today. <laughs> and Jesus is like, hey, on those days, if you would just refer back to this particular passage of Scripture and rem be reminded that it's our father. Because you know what? When we think our father, we stop thinking about my problem. We stop thinking about my context. And we start lifting our eyes to realize, man, there's something else going on around us. See, it's about what God is doing in community. Now, I want to say this, especially again to the men tonight. 
You know that you cannot achieve what God has called you to achieve. You cannot fulfill what God has called you to fulfill on your own. Now, don't get me wrong. You can do a lot of stuff, a lot of really great stuff. You can actually accomplish a lot. But you know what you're gonna do if you do it on your own? You're gonna build an empire. But I don't believe God is calling the men of the kingdom of God to be building empires, but instead building the kingdom. And I wanna, I wanna call you up tonight. If you're a man that's right now building your own empire, trying to figure out, man, how can I leave a legacy that shows how good I was? Can I tell you this tonight, friend? The greatest legacy that you can leave is not one that shows how good you were, but one that shows how good God was, even when you weren't good, even when you couldn't do it on your own, even when you messed up, that God was faithful. See, I'm not talking about leaving a natural legacy. I'm talking about leaving a supernatural legacy. Now that doesn't mean that you won't accomplish and achieve things and build things along the way, but the context has got to be the kingdom. What are you building tonight? Because man, you can make yourself really busy and do a lot of stuff, but end up in a really lonely place. Alex and I, we were talking about this even on the way in tonight. Someone that we know just spent their whole life building something from literally nothing just sold a company for tens of millions of dollars. But the pain in their life, in their family, got all the money in the world, and yet still empty on the inside. I believe God is calling men to rise up and be builders, not of empires, but of the kingdom. Because it's gonna leave an eternal, eternal consequence. See, when we have the knowledge of the Father, but not our Father or my Father, then we have a wrong perspective. See, personal relationship turns something that can seem punitive and reveal it as prosperous. When we have a personal disconnect from God, it's easy to think that, man, the Word of God, God's instruction, God's way of showing me how to do things is to bring me down or to keep me contained or to take all the joy out of life. But can I tell you this? When you're seeing it from a distance, you're not realising you're seeing it through a punitive outcome rather than a prosperous outcome. But when you have close proximity with God, when you hear the heartbeat of God, When you read His Word and realise that it's not written to shut you down, but to actually set you up to win, to walk into freedom, to walk into the destiny that He actually prepared and created for you before you ever took a breath, then you'll realise, man, God has more for me than I could ever imagine. In this particular chapter in Matthew chapter 6, there's a word that actually pops up several times throughout this chapter. And I wanna give you just one example of it, but it happens several times. You can go and read this yourself. But in in Matthew 6, verse five and six, it says this, it says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. Turn to your neighbour and say, reward. I'm going to need you to turn to the other neighbour and say that like you believe that that's a word worth saying. Say reward. And it goes on to say, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Say it again. Say reward. Reward. Oh, come on. Say reward. reward. That's better. It's a good thing. Reward. Now, it'd be easy to think when we read this particular passage that the Word in verse 5 and the Word in verse 6, they seem to be the same. This is part of the challenge of the English language because it's the same Word, but actually if you dig into this a little deeper, they're not the same Word. They read the same way in the English, but they were never meant to read the same way. See, the word in verse 5, the word for reward is a word, mistos, which means wage, or it means the fruit of my labour. It means, you know what, I got up and I went to work and I earned my paycheck and that's what I got. Not a cent more, not a cent less. I got what I deserved. That was my reward. But in verse 6, even though the word seems the same, is a different word. It's this word apodidomy, which actually means give back or restore again, a sense of 
continually giving back. It's, it's actually the same root word that we read of in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, where it says, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It's like this supernatural reward. Now you put in context here in the Scripture, what is Jesus saying? Now, yeah, He's talking about prayer, but put it in the context of life. See, many people, they do things for the outcome. They do things in front of other people, hoping for accolade, hoping for the reward of being validated by the people around them. You know what? I wanna do something. I I wanna get more followers. I wanna build a bigger brand. I wanna build a bigger business. I wanna do this so that people can recognise what I've done is worth something, is of significance. And you know what? You will get your reward. You'll get what you put in. Accept that. If you'll do it God's way, and in this particular passage, it's talking about, you know what, don't worry about doing it in front of other people. Just go and do it, maybe in quiet, just between you and God. And you'll get a reward that's going to keep on giving, that's going to keep on giving, that's going to keep on giving, that's going to keep on giving. See, the world has a way, and the world's way will bring a reward, but God has an even greater way. And God's reward is not just limited to what you do. It's not the same kind of math. It's not one plus one equals two. See, God's math doesn't work out the same way. Supernatural math works out a little different. God has an exponential addition. See, the world's way is just kind of basic math, but God's way, it it, it just, you look back and you're like, but I just, it was like one plus one, but all of a sudden it equaled 10, and then it equaled 20, and then it equaled 50, and just when I thought it was gonna run out, then it went into the hundreds and the thousands. Why? Because God's ways are supernatural. And I wanna stir some of you men here tonight. You've been doing this in the natural, in the flesh, but actually God wants you to switch off the noise of how everyone else is doing it around you and get in the secret place with Him. And begin to ask Him, God, what's your way? What's your way? What's your way? See, there's a supernatural return when you do things God's way. I believe there's been an assault on godly manhood. As we look around society, our culture right now, there's an assault on godly manhood. There's an assault on manhood. We hear these terms and phrases like toxic masculinity thrown around. We see men that are abandoning the idea of even being a man. They're abandoning the idea of even the gender of being birthed as a man. And I understand in part why some of this is happening because there's been so much pain associated with the wrong demonstration of what it means to be a man. It has caused an ugly response because there's brokenness in the world. And so right now there's a pendulum shift, a pendulum swing away from what it really means to be a godly man. But I believe here, even in this place tonight, God wants to restore and redeem what the enemy's even been trying to seduce you with, trying to break and confuse in your life. Man, I've never experienced so much confusion in people's lives like we are seeing right now. And it is a tool of the enemy to confuse people of their, not just their identity, but the way God has created them to function. And I wanna call you up tonight. Man, I wanna tell you that God wants to redeem everything that the enemy wants to steal. See, part of it is we have seen people say, well, you know, that's what the Bible says. Women have got to submit to their husbands. See, this is case in point. I I want to take a moment and just read to you from Ephesians 5 because the Bible does actually say, wives, submit to your husbands. But if that's all you take, then you're actually missing the most important part of this particular passage of Scripture. Come on, thank you. Sharon, I might need you up here on this. It says this in Ephesians 5.22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Just let's take note of that for a second. Submit to your own husbands. Let's, Let's not worry about submitting to everybody else's husbands. It's not what the Bible's saying. Submit to your own husband. As to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, please, let's not stop there. It's a very important context for what we're about to read. Because it says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Let's just start there. But you don't understand, Pastor Henry, what I have to put up with. I don't care. I mean, I do, but I don't because there's no, the Bible's not saying, you know what, if your wife is perfect, if she's got it figured out, if she's, you know, like the, the, the complete, you know, context of a Proverbs 31 wife and she's amazing in every single, there is not a woman on earth and my wife is amazing, but there is not a woman on earth that is perfect. So let's just take that out for a minute. It, it doesn't give this, the, the excuse to only love if our wives are perfect. Now I'm, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna give you a little side note here. My wife is much more perfect than I am, like just so we can get this out, right? But I don't love her because she's more perfect than I am. I love her because actually it's the requirement of God. And if I expect my wife to want to be led, I've gotta first start by loving her before I can lead her. Oh, I think that, I would hope that there are some wives that are screaming the house down right now, but. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. I wonder if there's been such a rebellion, such a fear in women to want to submit to men because they've never felt safe enough to want to submit. They've never been given a context or a place of love that they feel safe to be able to follow. So this is not about a framework from male dominance. It's not about a framework to say, women, you've got to submit to a dominant male. It's not that at all. It's a, it's a framework for male dependence. Not a dependence on self or on each other, but a dependence on God. Because you will never be able to love your wife. And maybe you're a single guy here in the room saying, I'm not even married. Just take this stuff in because it's gonna give you the best marriage you could ever imagine. Because man, when you first get married, you think life couldn't get any better. And it's amazing until it's not. And you have a moment where you're like, oh, this is hard now. But this is where it takes a supernatural love. A supernatural love. I want to call you up because the Holy Spirit wants to do something in you tonight. He wants to do something in you. See, we have a great responsibility as men to love, to love, to love, to love. I want to say this tonight, men, it's time to step up. 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 I'm going to say it again. It's time to step up. See, I want to declare this over the men here in the room tonight online, whether you're single, married, widowed, divorced, you have always and will always be a man of God. It's who you were created to be and it's who you always will be unless you decide to believe the lie of the enemy. But I'm declaring over you tonight that no matter your failure, you are still a man of God. You are still a man of God. See, the world needs men and fathers who are strong, but not violent, gentle, but not weak, encouragers, not exacerbators, men who are secure enough to serve instead of needing to be served, men who lead instead of Lord, men who choose love over lust, commitment over comfort, men who choose the real deal instead of cheap thrills, men who empower instead of suppress, men who build up instead of break down, who are protectors, not protagonists, men who are self sacrificing instead of self-centered, men who defend and do not demean, whose lives are in godly order 
instead of disorder. Men who learn how to tend to the heart rather than just fix the problem. Who lead their families with strength and not stress. Men who care more about being a powerful man of God than just being a man of power. Who stand up instead of bow out. Who are more passionate about the Scriptures than they are about the scores. Who demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit and not the fruit of a few too many glasses of Spirit. This is the kind of man that God is calling up tonight. Come on, it's time for men to begin to stand up. It's time to stand up. It's time to stand up. To be a man of righteousness, of integrity, filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't care what your failures are. Your failures are not your future unless you allow the plans of the enemy to outwork in your life. It's time to let go of the failure. It's time to let go of the past. It's time to let go of the things that were broken in the past and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. Come on, get back in the game. 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 Get off the sideline. Get back in the game. Get back in the game. Get back in. I'm telling you right now. Get back in the game. Get back in the game. Get back in the game in life. Get back in the game in your job. Get back in the game in your workplace. Get back in the game in your marriage. Stop walking out the door saying we're done. Get back in the game. It's time to get back in the game. We're going to be done in a second. Maybe the band can come and help me close this out. Otherwise, we're going to preach this thing till heaven comes. I, I want to say this over the, especially the young men. I know that there's quite a few young men here in the room tonight. Maybe you're a young man watching tonight. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you're a college student. Maybe you're in your 20s. Maybe you're even in your 30s tonight. Can I say this to you with all the love and gentleness and encouragement and strength that I can and say this? It's time to stop playing games. And I'm not just talking about video games, although you should. Now, a little bit of Forza every now and then, okay, no worries, but stop playing games. Stop playing games with your future. Stop playing games with your calling, with your destiny, with your purpose. Stop playing games with the hearts of those girls in your life right now. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Some of you, you think these apps are games. Oh, what about this one? Did I win? Oh, no, it was a loss. Game over. New game. Oh, what about this one? Oh, game over. New game. Some, some of you are, you're too afraid to commit because you think, what if there's a better option? You, you realise this. Those apps they are built with no end. They're built just to keep going and going and going and going and going. Now, if you met someone on an app, I'm, I'm not saying that that can't happen. But I will say this. There is an inherent issue because for most guys, they just want to keep scrolling until we find the perfect scenario. And even then, what, what if, oh, what, what if, what if there's something better? I want, I want to, again, say this with all love and grace tonight. You're probably not worthy of the best looking girl that's on that app. And I don't mean that in a cruel way you're probably not quite as good looking as you think that you are. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. H hear my heart. Because even if you're the best looking dude right now, at some point you won't be. <laughs> some point, you can get old. <laughs> Certain parts of your body just keep growing. Your ears keep growing. Noses keep growing. You know, <laughs> eyebrow hairs just start kind of coming out like caterpillars. So, so don't be afraid to take care of yourself, all right? You know, but... I, 
I think that we think, if I can just find someone that all of the details seem to be perfect, then my life will be perfect. My wife has said this many times over the 23 years that we've been married. I didn't quite measure up in the looks department to what she was hoping for. Now, her, kind of the goal was Brad Pitt and I wasn't quite there. <laughs> but you know something really interesting? Is that the more she fell in love with Jesus and the more that I fell in love with Jesus, the, the more our love for Jesus became the most attractive thing. Now, I'm, I'm gonna say this, I married up in a big way, all right? So that was important. But it was actually our love for Jesus and our passion for the things of God that has kept us. Even when we went through moments where we didn't feel attractive, where we didn't feel like, man, we're, we're feeling this right now. You know what I mean? It was our love for Jesus and our commitment to Jesus that has brought us 23 years strong. And in fact, we're more in love with each other now than we've ever been before. And my wife would, in a, in a, in a, in a funny way, she would say, man, you, you are, you're much better looking now than what you were back then. It's, I think because I've got more of Jesus in me. I wanna tell you guys, the most attractive thing about you has gotta be Jesus. Because it's the only thing that won't fade. And in fact, hopefully, the more you fall in love with Jesus, it's just gonna get brighter and brighter and brighter. And while the world's looking at all the exterior things, I believe what you want is a woman who's gonna look at the heart. And while you're at it, why don't you start looking for someone who it's their love for Jesus that shines brighter than anything else? I believe that's when people fall in love with Jesus at the center, they can withstand every storm. Because man, we've walked through some storms. We haven't had a perfect marriage. We've had to walk through pain. We've had to face some pretty hard realities along the way. Even had a moment where we wondered if it was over. Except that, our love for Jesus. Our love for Jesus. See, you've got to be dependent before you can be dependable. There's too many men hoping to be dependable without first being dependent. You gotta be dependent on God, on His strength, before you can be dependable to the world around you, to your family. I'd love you to take a moment, stand to your feet if you're here in the room and close your eyes. If you're watching online, just take a moment if you will, close your eyes. I get a sense tonight that there are men that are watching, especially men that are watching that You've actually been struggling in your value, struggling in your worth. Hoping that if you can just do something that's recognized, do something that seems to be of value in the eyes of the people around you, that you will feel significant. But can I tell you tonight, friend, you, your significance, you'll never be fulfilled unless Jesus is at the center of your life. Unless Jesus is the one who's revealing your worth. Unless Jesus is the one who is showing you who you are, who you were created to be. His eyes are closed here in this room. I want you to understand this tonight, that a perfect father sent his perfect son to die on the cross so that a God who seemed far away could be known in close proximity. Maybe you've been around church. Maybe you've heard about Jesus before, but tonight you know you're not in a personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe you know of God as the Father who's out there, but you don't know of Him as my Father. I believe tonight God wants to reveal Himself through His Son, Jesus, to you as your Father. 
so that before you leave this place, you can say, my Father, my Father.